Hello, and welcome back to Jason Graves is Chillin'. It is 2 a.m. I'm going to try not to get angry. I'm going to try not to get mad. I'm going to try to keep things under control. Uh, not like I did earlier today, where I kind of flew off the handle. Check out the companion video to this that I just filmed. The top 10 overrated things. This is the top 10 underrated things. So these are things that I like. These are things that I think are a little underappreciated or underrepresented in the retro game community. Starting with number 10, which is the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and the Wii generation. Yes, these count as retro now. Kids today think of these consoles in the same way that I thought of like the Super Nintendo. Did you know that there is about the same distance between now and the Xbox 360 and the 360 to the NES? 19 years from then to then, and then 20 years from 360 to NES. It's basically the same gap, and when the 360 came out, there was basically no debate that the NES was considered retro, that the Super Nintendo and that whole era was considered retro. So, it's time to grandfather these things in, unless you're the mods of r slash retro gaming, in which case you're debating whether or not the N64 even counts as retro. But hey, we can't win them all. So anyway, people complain, I complain about how collecting old video games is basically dead. It's a... everything's too damn expensive, it's a fucking hellscape, you can't go to Goodwill and find deals anymore. Which is true if you're looking for cartridge-based stuff, or PlayStation 1 even games, that whole generation, but... You go up to the PS2, you go up to the PS3, 360... The collecting spirit is alive and well for those consoles, because the prices are at rock bottom, the games just aren't worth that much yet. And I really do think that the PS3 360 era is going to be one of the last collectible eras for video game consoles because they didn't, most of the games didn't require you to be online to play. It was the last really round of consoles where you could buy a game, you could put it in the system, and you could actually play it instead of just paying for a license to play a game when you buy a disc like you do now. With uh, the 360 and PS3 generation, it's really the last one where sh the shit just works. So, I think at some point those games are going to be worth money. Not so much maybe for the PS4, PS5 era. Remains to be seen. I'm not one of those retro gamers that will say that games were better in the 90s. I don't believe that. I really don't. I think that there's a lot of magnificent and unique stuff going on in the 360 generation. Um, it's just not an era that I'm not, you know, I'm not as familiar with it. I haven't played nearly as many games from that generation. I want to, maybe, in the future, but for now, you know, I'm still exploring the early 90s, I guess. I don't know, that's just what I'm more interested in, but it's not because I think that the games are better. It's really just a, a personal curiosity thing. The number nine most underrated thing in all of retro gaming are unique and original controllers. I feel like we're in an era, even when you're playing retro games, of one-size-fits-all controllers. So, like, look at the look at the modern controllers. We got all three modern controllers. These are the main controllers for each of the three modern consoles. I know the Switch has Joy-Cons or whatever, and they're a little wacky, but who the hell uses Joy-Cons is, like, not me. So, you know, they look pretty much the same, right? We retrofit everything into working with a standard layout these days but as you well know that wasn't always the case pretend it's 1998 and think about what the three standard major controllers were then they couldn't have been any more different we've got the n64 we've got the playstation and then we've got the saturn and there are all these wacky fucking contraptions of course the the playstation one is what would go on to become the standard but you know we had three very distinct controllers for three very distinct systems and three very distinct game libraries um a lot of that uniqueness has just kind of been lost over time most things are multi-platform i guess i'll show up the saturn controller like look at how fucking wacky this thing is right you've got like a sliding like analog thing it's not quite an analog stick it's it's like a fucking slider almost like on a 3ds it's just they're all so fucking crazy. Like, you all know about how stupid the N64 controller is. It's got, like, the three handles, but... Of course, you're a real gamer. You play stuff like this. So, a lot of times people just set up... Even when they're playing old games, you'll set up, like, your retro arc, and then you'll just hook up your Xbox controller to it. 
And then all of these control schemes will have to be filtered through this controller. And even with something as simple as, like, Sega, it's a little weird. Because it has six face buttons, which meaning that, you know, we've only got four here. So two of them are going to have to be on up top. And it's just, it's a little awkward just for everything involved. When I play old games, I'm such a stickler for the old controllers. I almost refuse to play with any other control scheme. I'm fine with emulation, but I have so many adapters and ways to just play um, emulated games with the original controllers to make up for that. I don't know. I'm like, to me, like the playing with an actual controller for the console is paramount to, you know, enjoying the game as it was intended to be. And uh, filtering it through one size fits all control schemes is, it leaves a lot to be desired. The number eight most underrated thing in retro gaming are role-playing games, or RPGs. So, the thing with RPGs is a lot of retro gamers just flat out ignore them. They're like the country music of uh, retro gaming. So if you ask a music fan what they listen to, a lot of times they'll say, oh, well, I'll listen to anything. And then if you ask a retro gamer what they play, they'll be like, oh, well, I play anything. Except country music. Except RPGs. For whatever reason, that's just the one genre that they don't touch. And a lot of people cite them as just being very samey, um, of there being a lack of diversity, that they're all just, like, menu-driven, and they're all basically... They imagine, like, a generic Final Fantasy. Like, they imagine, I don't know, a Dragon Quest game, and then they think that every RPG is like that. But that's not... You know, if you watch my show, you know that that's far from the truth. In fact, I would argue that... The um, RPGs, especially in the early 90s, were much more diverse than most other genres, right? Like, if I show you four screenshots from four random platformers, they look pretty fucking samey, right? But if I show you four RPGs, it could be four completely different things. And I would argue that something like the fighting genre, that the one-on-one -on -one fighter, that those are so samey. I would argue that even now, they haven't really meaningfully evolved past Street Fighter 2. Now, obviously, I don't play fighting games. I'm not a fan of fighting games. But I look at the newest games, and I look at Street Fighter 2, and aside from, like, flashier graphics, I don't even really see a difference mechanically. They look like the exact same game. They look like people have been re-releasing re the exact same game for decades, and nobody's ever called them out on it. Which leads me into the number seven most underrated thing about retro gaming. Sports games. <laughs> So, if RPGs are like the country music, then this is like, I don't even know what this is. This is like some shit that nobody would ever admit. This is like Weird Al parody songs. Like, nobody would ever admit to listening to them. And this is like, I don't know, like Minecraft songs or something. Just some shit that like nobody would ever admit to listening to. Um, now, I love sports. I love sports games. I was never um, one of those people who understood, like, people who took a side. Like, oh, you either gotta be a jock or a nerd. And it's like, well, why can't you just be into, like, everything? My, uh, my interests really haven't evolved since I was, like, ten years old. And my favorite things when I was ten years old were basketball and video games. And they still are. And the thing about me is that I'm at, like, a weird cross-section between uh, people that doesn't really exist. Because most people that are into sports games are not also into retro games. And most people that are into retro games are not also into sports games. Meaning that, you know, it gets like the double shaft. Like, even people who play sports games really couldn't give a shit about old sports games. But I love old sports games. I love firing them up just to see, like, the player's stats and the player's ratings. Like, you... That's one of my favorite things about playing old Madden games. I... Man, I fucking love Madden. I can tell you the difference between almost every year of Madden. That's how big of a nerd I am about those. Hell, one of my favorite games of all time is MVP Baseball 2005. And I don't even like baseball. I couldn't name more than, like, a handful of players. I couldn't even name all the Major League teams. Like, if you forced me, gun to my head, name every Major League Baseball team, I would fail. Like, I, I might not even be able to name half. I don't, I don't know a damn thing about baseball. But that's just such a fantastic game. And a lot of people complain that they're not innovative or that they don't, you know, iterate enough. Where it's like, well, yeah, they're tied to concrete rules of a sport. Of course they're not going to be innovative. Um, the players who play them don't demand innovation. And that's 
you know, they, like, they don't want it. If you play Madden this year, you don't want to pick up Madden next year and have to relearn everything. You're going to want to basically know more or less what you're doing with a few things added on, a few things smoothed out. And, you know, in their heyday, they did a good job of that. Here's the base appeal of sports games. Well, yes, it's true. I could go outside and play basketball. I cannot go outside and play in the NBA. I don't have the talent. I could go outside and play football, but I'll never win the Super Bowl. My favorite sports team, out of all sports, is Syracuse football. I care about them the most. Dad and I had season tickets through my whole childhood. I haven't missed watching a game since 2005 by my count. I could name the entire starting offensive line last year, which is the true test of a real football fan. They're my favorite sports team, and they will never win a championship in my lifetime. You know, the ultimate goal of sports to win a championship will never happen for my team. And that's not just me being pessimistic, The maybe 2% of you listening who know college football know exactly what I'm talking about. There's such a rigid hierarchy with politics, geography, and money at play that it's just not a realistic outcome. There's only about, I don't know, 20 teams who can maybe win championships, and Syracuse is not one of those 20 teams, far from it. I mean, yeah, they did win a title once in 1959, but that was only because they were one of the only teams which allowed black people to play. So, uh, yeah, they don't have that advantage anymore. So in real life, they don't have a chance. But in my NCAA 14 save file, they've won nine championships in a row. And that's why sports games rule. They're about wish fulfillment. Making the impossible possible. The number six most underrated thing about retro games is that I can actually bring myself to play them. A lot of times, when I try and play a modern game, I get so glazed over before the game actually gets anywhere that I just can't bring myself to do it. I just, I can't do it. It's like you turn it on, you gotta wait for a fucking update, and then you're stuck in tutorial hell for a few hours, and I just, I can't bring myself to care. It feels like that older games are a lot more cut and dry with what they expect of you. Whereas newer games will fucking make you beat around the bush. They will fucking make you go in circles and do a bunch of bullshit that doesn't make, like, any sense. It doesn't make the game better. And my example for this is going to be the Final Fantasy VII Remake. Not the one that just came out, but the original Final Fantasy VII Remake from a few years ago. I booted it back up again because I, I played it when it first came out for a little bit and I just couldn't get into it. I got, like, five or six chapters in and I dropped it. But... I booted it up again with the delusion of thinking that I would be, you know, I'd get up to speed for the new remake. But man, just... That is not a fun game. <laughs> like, at all. The original Final Fantasy VII, for the first, you know, the, the Midgar part, is so concise and tight that there's, like, no fat left over. It's just... A very direct game. Like, things happen at a breakneck pace, and they're constantly happening, and you're seeing new set pieces and introduce new characters, and things keep... things move really fast. Where, as in the remake, just by the nature of it, it's so fucking... everything is so drawn out. Like, you go back to the slums, and it's like, nope, now you gotta kill rats, now you gotta explore the town, and talk to a bunch of fucking people that don't exist in the original game. And then you gotta do these fucking random quests before we'll let you fucking do anything. Then you go back to the bar and it's like, oh, nope, now you gotta wait. Well, we fucking discuss shit downstairs. And now you gotta play darts. And now you gotta fucking, like, beat up some thugs for no fucking reason. Like, you go back outside and then you get, like, assaulted by some fucking random people. And then you get, like, a good piece of content, like, going on the date with Jesse. But it's, like, those are few and far between for everything else that is just fucking added to just pad the shit out. If a game's gonna have padding, let it be transparent. Like, when a game introduces a boss that is, like, too strong and I need to grind, that's one thing. I mean, sure, you could call that padding, but I'll take that padding. That's, like, straightforward padding. That's introducing an obstacle and having you overcome it. This is just, like, a bunch of fucking busy work, and I... I don't have fucking time for that. I hate it. The number five most underrated thing in retro gaming... are... Manuals slash other promotional materials that are included with the games. Right here, I got Ultima. 
So I'm a little late to this train because I really didn't start taking manuals seriously in my reviews until maybe like six months ago. A lot of times I just kind of went with the approach that the game is the game is the game and all the other shit is the other shit. But I've grown and appreciated an appreciation for a good manual and how it can supplement a game. So actually the NES Ultima games aren't as good of an example of this as the Super Nintendo ones, but I don't have the manuals for those so I can't show you. But they'll include like short supplemental stories in there. And it'll really just flesh out the game world. Now, and, and that's something that most modern games have um, gotten rid of. But I do hold the one exception, really, to the rule. Cyberpunk, when it came out, came with all sorts of stuff. And it got me really excited. This is a game that I really wanted to get into. Like, here's a map of the, the game world. Here's, like, a lore guide. This was really fucking cool to read through while the game was installing. And I wish that more games just had the the love and care like that put into them. As, uh, you know, a lot of old games did that. And the number four most underrated thing about retro video games is the Sega CD. And to a lesser extent, the Sega Saturn. So, the Sega CD gets lumped in a lot with the 32X as just out-and-out out failures that were meant to, you know, add on to the Genesis, they get grouped into the same thing. And in my overrated video, I went on a rant about the 32X. But the Sega CD gets the short end of the stick in that being lumped in with it because it is so much better than the 32X. And it's actually a very robust platform in its own right. There's a lot of great games on the Sega CD. And if you compare the library to something like um, the Atari Jaguar or the 3DO, you know, other alternative game systems of the early 90s, I would argue it comes out better. Of course, it's, it, I mean, it's a lot better than, like, the CDI. It's arguably better than something like the Turbo Graphics. Now, I haven't played enough Turbo Graphics to make the distinction yet, but, like, I'd pick it right now. And plus, it's the fucking system with Snatcher. This thing plays Snatcher. How could you fucking not like it? There's some, like, actual gems on this thing, but you should uh, definitely hit subscribe because I might have a video coming up. In fact, my next video even might actually be a little deep dive into the Sega CD, so I guess stay tuned for that. A lot of people rag on the Sega CD for the FMV games, but in retrospect, FMV games are so cool. They're such a relic. There was a brief moment in time where some old-ass, crusty video game executives thought Night Trap was the future of video games. And when you're not spending 60 bucks on a game, you know, you're just downloading them for free, I'll mess with some FMV games. Hell yeah. What makes the Sega CD cool is that it's basically just a Sega Genesis, but the games are on a CD, meaning that they have way more storage space to work with. Before homebrews during the domestic life of the Genesis, the maximum cartridge size was 8 megabytes. Even then, they rarely got that high. Whereas a CDR could hold 650 megabytes. That's what made all these full motion videos possible, but it was more commonly used for music. Did you know that there are 207 Sega CD games? More than I expected. And 19 of them are full motion video games. Granted, that's a sizable chunk, but it's far from everything. You've also got these sort of experimental visual novels with Snatcher or Space Adventure. You've got a few point and clicks in the form of Willy Beamish or something like the Sherlock Holmes duology. A couple of RPGs, Lunar, Vey, an incredible version of NBA Jam, whatever the heck Panic was supposed to be, enhanced Genesis games such as Echo the Dolphin and Earthworm Jim. There's underrated variety for this thing. Now, it didn't light the world on fire, but it sold two and a quarter million units, which isn't an abject failure either. The real problem with the Sega CD is that the thing was too expensive, and that's what really held it back. $300 in 1992 money is $674 today, which is more than a PS5. It was more than double the Genesis itself, meaning that you had to be a rich kid to get this thing. But if you took the plunge, there was plenty here to wet your wild woody with. Whoa, Whoa big fella! You got a name, leadhead? Call me Woody. Wild Woody! Why is it daytime all of a sudden? Don't worry about it.
The number three most underrated thing in retro video games. This is Jurassic Park on the Super Nintendo. This is Jurassic Park on the Sega Genesis. These are not the same game. In fact, they're not even close to being the same game. They are entirely different. Number three most underrated thing are unique port jobs, unique offshoots, weird side games that don't exist now. These days, if a game comes out, it'll be the same exact thing on PS5 and on Xbox. And if there's a Switch version, it will likely just be a scaled back or a shittier performing version of the original game. Not so in the 90s, not so in the 2000s. You would get so many different games released for so many different systems based on the same property. The same base game could be so it could have so many variations. Let's bring up the sports example again. I know how much you guys love sports games, but Madden again. So in the 2000s, there were so many different variations of Madden, and I was always fascinated by them. You have to think that in the mid-2000s, they were making it for the Game Boy Advance, the DS, the PS2 generation, like the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube. They were making it for the PS3 and 360 generation, and they were making it for PC, and I think there was even like a cell phone, like flip phone version of Madden at some point. They were putting Madden on everything. Same title, completely different games, obviously. Like the features would be different, how they would play would obviously be so different from each other. And seeing the same property, the same ideas get tackled in a million different ways, being filtered onto so many different devices at the same time, was just such a fascinating thing that you don't get in today's gaming landscape. There's no real modern parallel to that. Oh yeah, and licensed games. Not only big blockbuster movies, but smaller releases would get game tie-ins back then. All in all, they get a bad rap, but when done well, a good licensed game extended the property and provided experiences that weren't possible in the source material. I used Jurassic Park as an example already, but take something a little more benign, like the Rugrats PS1 game. Just being able to explore the house was such a cool addition. Licensed games are making a bit of a comeback now, you know, with the Harry Potter game, the Bluey game, Robocop, or whatever the heck else. But they were a bit of an endangered species for about a decade, regulated to the Lego realm. Though this entry is getting a little confused, I guess it's a bit of both. This entry can be licensed games slash weird ports to consoles that don't exist anymore. Just the kind of things that we don't get in the current gaming landscape. The number two most underrated thing in retro gaming is the entire early 3D generation. There is no shortage of people online who will say that this whole generation didn't age well. Oh, it looks like shit. It looks so primitive, it looks blockier, the 16-bit generation pixel art held up better. Held up better. And, I mean, you know, I'm a huge fan of the 16-bit generation of games, it's probably my favorite generation of games, but, at the same time, I love early 3D stuff almost as much. And I think it it's definitely has its own worthwhile place in history. And you can't just write it all off as just it not looking or it not controlling well because it's early 3D. There was so much artistic merit, I guess. You know, I mean, through art comes, um, through adversity comes art, right? Is the old saying. And there was plenty of adversary, adversary in the early 3D days. Adversity. There we go, that's the word. So recently I was sent this awesome Shining Force 3 repro by Knights into Dream, a seller on Shopify. Hashtag ad. Hashtag not really an ad. Hashtag don't get too excited because I'm not reviewing it anytime soon. But anyway, it got me to dig my Sega Saturn out of storage and I have been having a blast burning discs for the thing all week. Man, this was certainly a time and place. Here's this game called Death Crimson. Are you telling me that an era where graphic design standards could look like this hasn't aged well? It was a time where they'd make a little overworld for Sonic to run around in with their Genesis Sonic compilation. 
By the way, can you believe that they never bothered to make this into a full game? I mean, it seems like they already did the hard part, right? Creating physics and a controllable Sonic. Why not just slap some levels together and call it a game? But this is what the early 3D era was. A time of Namco museums with unnecessary but cool liminal spaces. Racing games supposedly set on Daytona Beach, only with fucking mountains for some reason. Mario 64 is a game that looks like a collection of Windows 95 screensavers. And why would anyone want it any other way? They can put out a game that is just taking pictures of Pokemon because seeing 3D models of the little rats was cool enough to base an entire game around. I opine for an era where 3D was new and exciting enough to justify existence by itself. And I say underrated because it seems like that this generation gets maligned more than any other, aside from maybe all of the pre-Nintendo shit. There are great games in any era, so don't sleep on the fifth gen. Which brings us, finally, to the number one most underrated thing in retro games. The idea that a game can be a singular, standalone work of art that it's not a product that can just be changed at the snap of a finger. The idea that a game is a game, will always be the game, and cannot be changed. This is Final Fantasy 3, 6, and there will never be an update where they remove an NPC's quest line because of alleged charity fraud. There will never be a day where they can take out things from this game. They can never alter the contents of this cartridge. Sure, they can re-release the game and make minor changes, and they do. For example, Zelda Ocarina of Time. They can re-release Zelda Ocarina of Time as many times as they want, but the contents of this cartridge, Ganon will always spit red blood, the moon shield, the moon shield, the mirror shield will always have the crescent moon, and the chanting in the fire temple will always be there. It doesn't matter what they do, they can't patch a cartridge. And this whole idea, and it doesn't just apply to games, it applies to just products at large, that the subscription model, that you pay for a continuous subscription, the fact that you don't own things anymore. I touched upon this in my number 10 thing, but the idea that you own a game and not just a license to play a game is such a huge fundamental difference in the way that gaming worked then as opposed to how it works now like at any time pretty much any modern game they can just thanos snap it out of existence they can snap their fingers and you will no longer be able to play the game it can just be gone forever they can just erase it when we talk about video game preservation in my overrated things list i went on a rant about how most of what retro gamers do is not video game preservation we should be much more worried about modern game preservation than we should about retro game preservation we have the retro stuff down it's what's out there now that can so easily be taken away from us they can't take this cartridge away from me but my copy of final fantasy 16 on the ps5 they could easily just snap their fingers and my disc is worthless and i will never be able to play that game ever again something like final fantasy 14 which is just like an online only game like how does this factor into everything just the idea of MMORPGs in general scares the frick out of me. I never got into them. I never liked them. That bird is being very obnoxious. <laughs> I guess just because the idea that, you know, everything can be taken away from me at a moment's notice. I'm not a fan of games as a service. I think that games should just be their own works of art. And that's that. So anyway, that's all I got. Check out the companion video, the top 10 most overrated things. And shout out to the patrons, shout out to William Robert Lee, of course. Didn't forget that. Never trust anyone who needs a haircut. Goodbye.